lurking under the rocks in cool, clear streams. There was a vast population of slimy creatures found all over the eastern United States. The beasts were from a 200 million year lineage and camouflaged at the bottom of the riverbeds with dark greens and browns all over their wrinkly skin. People said they looked like something from hell bent on returning, branding the name the Hellbender Salamander. And from this came the rumors. They're poisonous. They eat all of our fish. They bit my little Jamesethy, and now he has only three toes left. Anglers would line up for the local paper smiling wide, pride beaming, as they held their fishing lines strung with hundreds of dead creatures. And so from this woeful reputation came consequences. But it wasn't the intentional removal of the hellbender that brings us to today's plight, but rather the neglect of our misunderstood amphibian. Hellbenders really like cool, clean, swift flowing water. You know, the Midwest at some point probably had great hellbender streams, but when you added in all the sediments, you cleared the land for agriculture or housing, you know, the water temperatures went up, which is not great for hellbenders. The hellbender is North America's largest salamander. This is sort of a pretty unique species. It's an ancient species. It's one of those things that once it's gone, it's gone, and it's, it's almost gone in Indiana. It's gone from places like Illinois and probably gone from Mississippi and a handful of other states. And it's really only doing well in, in places away from people. Once the 80s rolled around, we had a biologist in Indiana that went out and he didn't find them anywhere except for the Blue River. It's the last place we really know that there are hellbenders left in Indiana. If you know there's hellbenders thriving in your backyard stream or river, you know that you have clean water. Whereas if there's too much agricultural runoff, fertilizer, debris and soil pollution intermingling with our, with our river system, hellbenders don't thrive, they die off. And that's exactly what happened in the past. They're, they're kind of like a canary in the coal mine. They'll let you know when something isn't right about your waterway. Rivers are an expression of what's happening on the land. A lot of the streams that feed Blue River are underground and they have their own diversity of life. Then you have this surface stream, which is gorgeous, and you get high oxygen because you have cool water coming in from the caves in the springs. And so that supports things like the hellbender salamander. So I'm always thinking about how do I make this river function for hellbenders? Hellbenders, in my opinion, are like the keystone species of the, of the aquatic part of Blue River. If we get things right for that animal, everything else will follow along. If we figure out how to make them able to thrive in places not just like Blue River and potentially even other streams in the future, then we really have achieved success. The headwaters of Blue River, the upper reaches, is really agricultural. And so that community has a really strong ethic when it comes to soil conservation. I was seeking a, a way to um, develop my grazing system. I was watering the cows at the uh, river crossing. I'd say in the beginning, I was a bit apprehensive of this tree planting. I was actually taking some of my best bottom ground and planting back the trees. Well, as you can see, our cows grazing here in this pasture. And along, you can see two, actually three stages of trees there. The new planting, they're 21 years old. And then the river line and the high bank going around the other side. This was going to aid the slowdown of the river in major floods, trying to control any kind of erosion. illustrates the point that trees slow the flow of water. 
and so they're slowing all this debris down, which is holding it back, and it's holding water back and power back, and so this is just a nice illustration of how trees provide us a service and also the power of the Blue River. So these are the, the larvae, uh, and we have about 60 hatched at this point. We still have a lot, though, left to hatch, and they're ready to pop. Any day now, the rest of these eggs should hatch and then move over into the, the larva system. But right now, we have uh, eggs that are at the very late stage of their development. They're in this, what's called a pseudochrysal, right? That's a fancy way to say a bubbler that makes the eggs spin around and move around a lot. and so. They get to rest as the bubbler is off. But if they stay down like that too long, you can have all kinds of developmental problems. They, they'll die if, if they just sat at the bottom of a tank. So periodically, the bubbler kicks back on, and that keeps them oxygenated and, and allows them to develop appropriately. And I see one in here that I'm going to scoop out and get him over here into the larval setup. And here we go. So I've got one. I'm gonna put him in here with the other ones. And now I just have to repeat that another 160 times and the egg rearing process will be complete. We had to design this space for what the hellbenders need the day before they get released into the wild. With the river system, we can create some, some flow, artificial flow, and then that helps condition the hellbenders so that they're ready to be released into a river because if they've lived in stagnant water their whole lives and now they're in a moving water river, they might not do as well. So this is going to be our large raceway. So this is going to be the closest thing that we have to a natural raceway system. I'll go ahead and show you some hellbendas that are in our large raceway here. I'll show you one of our really coolest ones that I'm super proud of. So this is a 2015 hellbender. He is a little over a foot and a half long, as well as roughly about two pounds. So we'll lift this lid up here. Hopefully he's home. There he is. He's the largest hellbender that we have in the facility right now. It's a unique experience. So this whole entire thing has been really cool to see. What is the root cause of that? Because that's what we have to get at. Um, we can put animals back in the river, but is that gonna help the problem or not? What Purdue is doing with their hellbender augmentation is they are addressing this bottleneck and that we have all these old individuals. And those are the animals that aren't doing so well in Indiana streams are the long lived old things. And so in the Blue River, I, I did my research on a species called the elephant deer, and the oldest individual I found from the Blue River was 72 years old, but the youngest one was 45. That's like going into a kindergarten class and there are no children. That's concerning. And so the same thing was happening with the hellbender, that we weren't seeing babies or enough babies. Any organism that lives in a river system is gonna need to be adapted to handle changes to the water quality more so than an animal that lives in the ocean or that lives in a lake. And that's because after a heavy rain, the water that flows into the river, it's carrying minerals, it's carrying dirt and debris and, and whatnot. So the amount of dissolved solids in the water can change very rapidly. Hellbender eggs and hell, adult hellbenders are, are pretty adapted to surviving parameter shifts. 
long term, if there's chronic uh, issues with the river system, then the eggs just simply won't make it past the, that first few weeks. What can we do on the land to ensure their survival and ensure that they can reproduce in this river? And so we got to thinking about what's changing, what's different. Uh, water quality seems to be improving. We, we know we have, still have hellbenders in the river, so it isn't that the water quality is so degraded that they can't live here. What's going on? By clearing forest and climate change, that has caused uh, more intense rain. The rivers, they're widening, they're getting wider and flatter. And so you're getting more and more stream bank erosion. It's sediment, it's mud in the water. <laughs> It's a river that every time there's a precipitation event, a rain, a big rain, a storm, a lot of snow melt, it's already at the level that's stressing the animals, particularly the young, the larvae that, that are so vulnerable to this, this uh, uh, pollution because you know they live in that water and they breathe through their skin. We've put two probes in the river. These are water pollution probes that are measuring uh, the sediment in the water, both the concentration and the amount flowing down the river. It, it's one thing to be subjected to a concentration at one point in a snapshot, but what these probes are showing is that they're subjected to it continuously. Hellbenders are brooded through the, the fall and winter months, and they're emerging as these babies in the early spring. Maybe they used to encounter a lower flow or a more even flow. And now the stress of these additional flushes is potentially washing them out. How many, how many do we have, Shelby, 17? Yes. So today, Purdue University and the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, we met up with a lot of our partners from several zoos in Indiana, and we released juvenile eastern hellbenders back into the Blue River at a site where they, they definitely used to have hellbenders here. Uh, the hope for these guys is that eventually we'll get enough of them in here that they'll start reproducing with each other and have successful recruitment. There's so few hellbenders left in the river that they really don't come in contact with each other to breed, so, so they're not replacing themselves. So we hope that we can get enough back in here that as they reproduce, the larvae actually survive and they start replacing themselves so we don't have to do it. One of the things that we've been doing over the last five years is going through all of the creeks in the Hellbenders' former range in southern Indiana and evaluating them for, uh, could we put Hellbenders back here? That maybe for future releases, if we're satisfied with what we've done in the Blue River. Purdue leads what they call the Hellbender Partnership, and they bring together a diverse array of partners to talk about the status of the Hellbender, the work that's going on. I was listening to that presentation and they started describing Big Indian Creek in Corridon, and that it had ranked just as high as the Blue River in habitat quality. It's actually a tributary to the Blue River, but we decided not to release hellbenders in there because it has several dams, uh, at least two of which were pretty large. We were invited to assist with removal of two lowhead dams uh, in Indian Creek in Corridon. Taking dams out in Indiana is still a relatively new phenomenon in terms of improving fish passage and in-stream habitat and safety for humans. As a part of the hellbender restoration, the pools behind the dams would not create the type of habitat that hellbenders need. So by removing them, it opened up uh, about five stream miles of brand new habitat that was buried under the water behind those dams. Stream ecosystems are very resilient if we simply give them the chance to restore themselves. Since those dams are removed and, and that will open up several miles of actual good hellbender habitat now, we are reconsidering putting hellbenders back there. 10 years ago, I guess, we mentioned a hellbender salamander and I hadn't heard the term. And they're not seen 
They're out there in, under a rock, and they look like a rock when they're in the water like that, and they're not out here walking around looking pretty like Daisy. <laughs> it's not today, it's tomorrow. It's not next year. This is, this is something that we know has been going on. The hellbender decline has been going on for 20 plus years. And it was something we can stop, reverse, slow down, and make it better for the hellbender and mankind both. Well, then we need to know about it. We're here for just a little while, and, and uh, we've got to take care of this place we live in. This community has come together around this animal. It really is like a community mascot. They have a universal story in that they need clean water. And everybody can do things for clean water. Um, everybody can do things for conservation. It wasn't just one person that said we need to bring deer back to Indiana or bald eagles or otters. That was a group of people that said this species is missing and we can do something about it. And that requires a lot of people coming together. That's not done in a vacuum and it's not done alone. After all, None of the beliefs were true. In fact, we aren't so different from our dear hellbender. We too need healthy land and water to survive and thrive. These chunky slimies have reminded us that we are caretakers of the land. And now we are hellbent on returning them to the waterways. Oh, there are a bunch of nicknames for the Hellbender. So, so we have Hellbender, and then the most common nicknames would be, there's Grampus, there's Allegheny Alligator, we've got the Snot Otter, some people call them Mud Dogs and Mud Puppies. Uh, old Lasagna Sides, that's, a, that's kind of a popular one because of the, the folds of skin that they have down the sides of their body. They think they look like lasagna noodles, so that's a fun one. My personal favorite is snot otter. Yeah, why, do, why are they called that? Uh, because they feel like snot and they live in the water, so I just went with snot otter. They look very snotty. They, they are so snotty when they get upset, they just ooze. Really? Yeah, as, as they get more agitated, they produce more slime. It's a, a defense mechanism, and so eventually they're just dripping snotty slime all over the place. Thank you.